digital technology, innovative ideas, and in the passive implementation process, there is a window of opportunity to shape our built environment and the cities in a way that reduces overall energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you very much. Recording in progress. Good morning, moderators. Please reassign me as interpreters if something happened with my connection. Thank you.
So good morning, and good afternoon, and like some good evening for the colleagues from a different time zone. Uh, I am Kurai Jairaman, who would be like some moderating this session. Uh, today's session uh, is the session five, standardization of the round cull in the bamboo structures. This is the fifth session of the 2021 International Online Seminar in Bamboo, a very sustainable construction material. This seminar has been happening in for the past, um, past month. And uh, today's session, like some particularly focuses on the standardization of the round bamboo structure. And firstly, I would introduce um, myself. I am Ray Jairaman. I work in INBAR as the Global Programs Director, and I would be moderating the session. Uh, so in collaboration with my colleague, Emmanuel Apaya Kabi, he is the senior lecturer uh, of construction and technology department of uh, department of uh, department at Akansan Apana Manakal University, Ghana. And uh, today's speaker, we have like some Kent Harris. He is the professor at the University of the Pittsburgh. Ivit Trujello, he is the chair of the Inbar Construction Task Force. And then he is also the assistant professor at the Coventry University. And uh, we have Ois Philip. He is the head of technology at Hayes Baha'i Foundation in the Philippines. And then we have Sebastian Kaminsky. He is the senior structural engineer of ARU. Uh, and then we have like Matteo uh, Incotamus Gonzalez. He is the technical development manager at CLTP Tasmania. And uh, all asked but not least, they will have Andrew Lawrence. He is the director at ARU. And as I like I mentioned previously, today's session would focus on the standardization of the round bamboo column structures. As, la, as, la, as many of you would already know, uh, the international standard organization have like published an international standard like recently in 2021, which is on the bamboo. Um, our la, our la, many of the speakers of today's present uh, today's uh, uh, seminar. Uh, so uh, the schedule of the presentation is we will have like one hour joint presentation of all the presenters in form of the pre-recorded video, and then followed by the question and answers session. So I would be uh, giving the floor at around uh, for the question and answer session to uh, Mr. Emmanuel, who would be handling the question and answers. Uh, so uh, uh, to start this session, so I have already moderated. And uh, um, so now after I complete it, I will give the floor to my colleague, Xingwei, who will be uh, uh, playing the video now, which is prepared jointly by all the speakers. So um, many thanks for all the speakers and uh, many thanks for all the participant who has been continuously attending the seminars for the past years. So Xingwei, can we have the video shared on the screen, please? Welcome to standardization of all calm bamboo structures. I am David Trujillo, chair of the Inbar Construction Task Force, UK head of delegation to ISO Technical Committee 165 Timber Structures, and nominated expert to working group 12 of that committee, structural use of bamboo. 
In this capacity, I was a project leader for ISO 22157-2019 and ISO 1916-24-2018, as well as a contributor to ISO 22156-2021. The format of the session will be as follows. Professor Kent Harris will provide an outline of ISO 22156-2021, then a panel constituted by task force members who contributed towards the writing of the standard will be interviewed by our guest, Andrew Lawrence. Andrew Lawrence is a global timber specialist at Arab, a Royal Academy of Engineering visiting professor at Cambridge University and lead author of the new edition of Appraisal and Repair of Timber Structures. Andrew represents the UK on the Timber Eurocode Committee and is convener of the Working Group for Execution of Timber Structures. He is also a conservation accredited engineer and a member of the Historic England Historic Estate Conservation Committee. Andrew is also a member of our Imbar Construction Task Force. Our panel of experts and contributors to ISO 22156 are Kent Harris, who is a professor of structural engineering at the University of Pittsburgh. He received a doctorate from McGill University in 1995, the author of over 320 peer reviewed papers. He is a US nominated expert to ISO TC 165, Working Group 12 where he acted as a project leader for ISO 22156. Professor Harris is a senior editor of the Construction and Building Materials, is a fellow of the, a, the American Society of Civil Engineering, the ACI, and IIFC, and is a licensed professional engineer in Ontario, Canada. Sebastian Kaminsky is an associate structural engineer in Arab Specialist Technology and Research Team in London. He specializes in structural use of bamboo with a focus on durability and the design of composite bamboo shear walls for seismic areas. He has published a number of papers and guidance notes on using bamboos appropriately for construction. Luis Felipe Lopez is the head of technology at Base Bahai Foundation in the Philippines and director of the Base Innovation Center, a materials and structures laboratory for sustainable construction. He's participated in the development of bamboo chapters for the Colombian, Ecuadorian, and Peruvian national design codes. He is the head of delegation for Colombia to ISO TC165 and nominated experts to Working Group 12. Mateo Gutierrez is a technical development manager at CLTP Tasmania. He provides technical advice and leadership on product development and quality stat control for engineered wood products mm -hmm. like CLT and CLT. Okay. He's a nominated expert to buy Standards Australia to participate in Working Group 12 of ISO TC165 and a founding member of SIPWADA Research Network. Okay, over to you now, Kent. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let me share my screen. All right, thank you, David, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to go through a, a relatively brief overview of 22156. Um, and so we will start. I think it's interesting just to take a, a very brief uh, journey and take a look at the, the, the history of, of these bamboo documents. Um, they date back to, to efforts um, probably in the mid to late 80s where a suite of proposed standards or a suite of standards was proposed um, dealing with full comb bamboo. And that, that's an important distinction. This would have been the first set of standards ever for full comb bamboo. Um, move forward about a decade and, and really work got formally underway with these standards at ISO. Um, interestingly, partially with partial support from the Dutch government at the time. Um, and in 2004, then the first versions of these standards appeared. This is 22156, which is the structural design standard and 22157, um, which is the, uh, excuse me, the physical mechanical properties, the test method standard. Um, and both of these are, are intense signifying documents. I call them version zero documents. They really draw a line in the sand and say, this is what we need to be able to do. Um, but in the case of the structural design document, they don't necessarily tell you how to do it or explain how to do it, but they allow you to look at an existing design and say, yes, it, it, it satisfies the intent of this particular document. Um, so they're very difficult to use um, as uh, as, a, as a forward engineer trying to design a structure. Um, move forward another decade and a great deal of work, as most people know, has gone on in the bamboo world 
um, certainly in this century, uh, in terms of research and development and, 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 and many new innovative structures. Um, and so we looked at starting to revise these initial standards. And I think that, um, and this then um, all under David's guidance at, at uh, uh, working group 12 of, of, of TC165. And I think that the most important step was in the, the first new standard uh, to appear in 2018, which is 19624, which is the grading standard. Um, so allow us to talk about bamboo a little bit more in terms um, of uh, in terms that people understand that engineers understand and give us a method for grading um, uh, the materials. This led uh, in 2019 to some fairly uh, significant revisions to the material test standard 22157, which uh, again came out in 2019, and then finally this year. Um, pulling these together, an extensive revision of 22156 um, on structural design. And one of the other things that I would comment on in, in this evolution is the adoption of now in the main title, bamboo structures rather than simply bamboo. And so we really have a, a, a scope that's much better defined. And we have, um, I think, stakeholders as a result that are better defined. Um, just a very brief uh, single slide background on each of the other two standards. 22157 uh, looks at physical and mechanical properties um, of bamboo. We're uh, as structural engineers, we're obviously interested in all of these, and it offers six. Uh, presently, it offers uh, six mechanical property tests, um, and a great deal of work is going on right now to refine these and, and decide which ones do we really need to be looking at. Um, which ones are primary and which ones may be secondary properties. Um, but it does give us a basis now for establishing material properties. Um, the grading standard, which I suspect we'll talk a little bit more about in, in today's session, um, isn't a standard that tells you how to grade bamboo, exactly what each grade is or something like this. What it does is it gives you a method, an approach to develop a grading um, uh, a grading approach for bamboo using either visual or machine grading or a combination. I think one of the great advantages of this particular document is um, in, in its annex, um, it gives a very nice example of how a grading um, approach may be used. Um, so moving on then to the, 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 the structural design standard, the one that we're interested in here today, um, 22156. When we open a standard, I tell my students the first thing that we do is we've got to look at the scope of the standard and make sure that it applies to the project that we have and that we're applying it correctly. And so if we look at the scope of 22156, we're addressing one and two story structures, residential, small commercial, industrial, light industrial type buildings, institutional buildings, not exceeding seven meters in height whose primary load bearing structure is round bamboo, full comb bamboo, or shear panel systems in which the framing members are made from round bamboo. Um, and so we have a couple of examples here that I think illustrate this very, very nicely. The image on the left, everything that's designed in the image on the left could be designed using this standard. We have the single comb and a floor support, the multiple comb beams running left to right, the girders beneath those, and even the and the column supports as well that are supporting this this uh, floor system. So all of this is then within the scope. Um, one of the the innovations of this standard that really I think will make it very useful to designers is that it permits two approaches for design: an allowable bearing capacity design approach, um, and a more traditional allowable stress approach. And so with bearing capacity or allowable capacity design, we can look at the grades of bamboo that we have. We can actually then test these and come up with member capacities under, under uh, standard type testing arrangements and actually um, come up with capacities for these members or capacities associated with each grade, which makes the uh, progression of design relatively straightforward. And um, we're proposing also that this can then be um, used to produce load span or capacity uh, tables. And we may get into a little bit of discussion of that today or not, I'm not certain. Um, 
and and so this is a very straightforward design approach that engineers can 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 use knowing the grades knowing the materials that they have available an allowable strength design is much more traditional we don't necessarily need to have this be uh, backed by grading although it might be in which case we simply or in, in this approach we simply take material properties that are, are known whether it's flexural properties as we're showing here we've got geometric properties we put these together into um, a the, the the section to determine the section capacities um, so also an approach that that's well known to engineers the standard also recognizes other design approaches as being equivalent to standard um, and so there is some guidance given in terms of adopting this standard for, for uh, in a partial safety factor design approach um, or res uh, resistance, low to resistance factor design uh, approaches. So in a European and East, uh, a Euro codes type approach or a North American type approach uh, as, as would be done with ASCE 7. The document also recognizes um, estab uh, previous established experience and, and limits this um, but certainly recognizes um, good established practice as equivalent to standard and it also lays out uh, a design by testing approaches and, and simply I'll, I'll show an example of that if we look at connections we've laid out an approach for design by testing for connections which identifies the testing protocols that will be used how to interpret those protocols in a uniform manner and then establishing characteristic design values based on that interpretation um, and this highlights another um, uh, another feature of the 22156 document is that we have relied heavily on existing ISO standards so we're building on the shoulders of others rather than trying to reinvent the wheel in this case um, there are many, many features of 22156. I want to highlight a few of them um, here at relatively briefly. Um, the document prescribes fundamental requirements for design and it is, excuse me, it specifically addresses a number of issues, some of which are relatively unique to bamboo. The first one, the susceptibility of bamboo to split longitudinally. Um, we all know bamboo splits. There's a number of features, there's a number of, of, of clauses within this document that attempts to address that and to mitigate the issues of splitting um, and to address them when they do occur. The issue of, of both structure and member redundancy, uh, which is important in, in terms of bamboo, uh, again, partially because of splitting and are also partially because of the, um, the desire that we have to be able to come in and replace portions of structural members if they are damaged um, in some manner. So that's a little bit of a different paradigm in terms of structural design. Um, the document identifies service classes uh, based on anticipated equilibrium moisture content of the bamboo. And so less than 12%, um, up to about 20%, and then greater than 20% in terms of equilibrium moisture content. Um, document provides significant guidance for um, uh, developing durable structures and adopts the use classes of ISO 21887. And then going a little bit further in terms of durability provides um, Annex B in non-mandatory language, which provides additional guidance um, for developing durable bamboo structures. And I have no doubt we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on today as well. Um, addressing the effects of elevated service temperature um, as separate from fire, as well as a, a brief section addressing um, fire. The document also addresses issues associated with maintenance inspection and particularly the ability to replace structural members. And this is a, a paradigm that, that is, is relatively unique to bamboo that we have um, multiple calm structural members and therefore we have the ability to repair these one potentially one calm at a time. And that speaks also to the need for member redundancy. Um, description and, uh, of, of connections and then finally, uh, a section on composite bamboo shear walls, uh, which I'll also discuss in, in just a minute. So if we look at durability very briefly, um, ISO 22156 adopts the 21887 use classes and then restricts the use of bamboo accordingly. And so there are multiple use classes shown here, uh, one through five. 
and bamboo is essentially restricted to one, two, and 3.1. Um, and you can see generally that we need to protect bamboo from damp from water. Um, there are limitations um, in, in, in 3.2 um, for short design life, and we would accept that sort of use class. Use classes four and five are not appropriate for bamboo. We're not talking about bamboo piles. We're certainly not talking about um, essentially bamboo in contact, um, in contact with the ground. Annex B then, which is a non-mandatory annex, really emphasizes so-called protection by design. And I'm pretty certain that we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on today. Um, connections are an interesting uh, area in bamboo. They're a little bit further behind uh, member design, I would argue. And so we talk about uh, in section 10, which addresses joints and splices. And we characterize these in this document essentially by the nature of force transfer between the bamboo elements. We identified on the left six different force transfer mechanisms, and then um, connections are essentially combinations of these. Not only are the capacities determined, and of course connection capacity is, is, is critical, but there are also provisions for looking at stiffness, ductility, and again resistance to splitting, because splitting is very common in many of these types of bamboo connections. For some well-known or relatively well-established connection types, there are specific um, uh, provisions. This is an example simply of, of dowels penetrating, uh, the provisions associated with dowels penetrating a comb, dowel bearing capacity, and then we provide an additional non-mandatory Annex D, which is sort of illustrative guidance looking at all sorts of different connections that have been proposed that are out there. Some are common, some are maybe not so common with guidance as to what clauses, what portions of section 10 of the 22156 document would these, well, where, would these be applied to if we were designing them? And so this is um, meant as an informative guide, certainly not an exhaustive one. Um, chapter 12 then addresses um, a structural system uh, that, that's fairly common in many areas of the world. Um, and again, I think we'll talk a little bit more about this today as well. Um, but the use of, of uh, bamboo frame construction, light cement bamboo frame construction, um, or more commonly known as composite bamboo shear walls. And um, there are not only provisions in section 12, Annex E, um, provide some additional guidance in how can we meet the requirements of 12? What works? And this is again, another aspect of 22156. It's built on sound science. It's built on good research, good background, but it's also built on outstanding experience over the last 20 years as, um, as well. Um, so finally, in summary, um, 22156 is a full comb specific standard. We're not talking about engineered bamboo in this document at all. Um, we believe it reflects the peculiarities of, of, of bamboo when it's used as a structural product. And it really is based on, um, well, now decades, uh, in decades of international experience, both in the lab and in the field. <coughs> Nonetheless, it is a model code. It is not in, it is intended to, excuse me, to be supplemented by national annexes when it's adopted. Um, and these annexes may describe things like limits on species, limits on dimension, grading practice, allowable stresses, uh, and so forth, other um, the aspects of national practice. Um, the, the broad applicability of 2156 is really, we believe, um, results from it being founded much deeper on existing standards um, uh, within the ISO suite, and particularly the promulgation of ISO 19624, the grading standard. I don't think we would have such a, a, a robust design standard without the grading standard. Um, as a result, the methods of 22156 should be familiar to, to engineers, uh, to design engineers. They've been revised for full comb bamboo materials, but they don't really represent, in our view, any impediment to adoption of bamboo for construction. So hopefully this document will 
um, accelerate the adoption of, of bamboo into the more mainstream construction. Um, and as I've mentioned, I think the provisions, the way they've been uh, designed are appropriate also for a translation into grade specific span and load tables. And of course, these may be something that will show up in national annexes. In fact, some work is already underway in this regard. Um, so I can take a kind of a, a very brief personal end to this particular discussion. Uh, it's my hope that the next revision of 22156 is not going to take another, well, what is it, 17 years. This is a living document. There are certainly acknowledged gaps in it. These gaps should be seen as research needs um, and hopefully new research will feed future revisions of this document. We hope that, that through seminars uh, such as this one and, and through use of the document, we'll engage the bamboo community, engage the engineering community, engage the, architect, um, the architecture community um, to adopt this uh, particular document. And we encourage designers not only to use it, but to criticize it, to supplement it, and hopefully ultimately make it better. And I think David will talk about this um, a little bit later, but there is a plan. So I'm gonna take David's thunder now. Um, we are working on a design guide that will accompany this document uh, that uh, iStructE will be publishing um, hopefully in uh, 2022. And so with that, I think we move to the panel discussion. Many and thanks I Vince, for that. Oh, brilliant. Sure. Sorry, Sorry. Uh, to interrupt you there. Uh, thanks again for that brilliant um, presentation and great summary of ISO 22156 bringing forward its qualities. Now, so now we open to the panel discussion. I invite Andrew to uh, start uh, raising the questions that he's prepared for us. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you, David. Um, and perhaps I could just say, I mean, I think it's that, um, that, that the team of you to have produced this, this standard, I think is remarkable. I mean, to take a what is really quite a variable natural material and, and actually to produce such thorough design guidance. Um, and I think um, I was, but before opening it up, I thought, how on earth would you write something which could actually fit in with all the different sort of existing design standards all over the world. And I think uh, you've really done that remarkably, something that can, um, so just, just to say how impressed I was with that. Um, so but perhaps I could just start us off. I think um, if we could start off thinking about the overall design of bamboo structures, should we say. So, uh, I mean, if I want to design some sort of bamboo building, I mean, will I find everything I need in here? You sort of alluded a little bit to sort of grading. I mean, is, is there more testing that I would need to do? What, what, what's... I think that's one for you, Kent. <laughs> I, I don't think that you could design any building from a single document. If I'm designing a steel building, I'm not going to, I can't find everything I need right in the AISC. And I apologize my North American uh, bias to this. Um, uh, or ASC uh, or CSAS 16, sorry, my Canadian bias as well. Um, bamboo is not nearly as um, mature as, as as other materials, in which case, no, we definitely do not have a one-stop shop. Um, a bamboo designer needs to sort of understand what they're trying to do from an engineering perspective. I think to design with bamboo, you need to be a good, competent designer. However, that said, I, I believe that, yes, you can design uh, the structures within within the scope, again, we're dealing with relatively simple structures. There are some limitations that we're presently um, applying to these structures. Um, but the document, yes, is is inclusive to, to my view. And I think I would uh, ask some of my colleagues who have been designing structures um, uh, potentially to comment on that as well. Luis, do you want to add yeah. something? Yeah, yeah. So definitely the, 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 the body of the standards allow you to design an entire structure. Of course, there is some uh, values that are not included in the in the body of the standard, but you can find them in the annexes. So that uh, will support the design as well. But something that is very important to say is that uh, the legal aspect. So you cannot use this standard until 
the country of the of the entity who regulates the the standardization in each country adopt the ISO standard. So I think that's it's an important topic that we need to define because, as all of all of we know, this standard has not jurisdiction at all. So it needs to be first adapted by the local entity uh, to uh, become a national standard. And and I think just to add to that that. Adoption would likely come with national annexes. I touched on that at the end as well. Um, there is not a, uh, a, there are no limits on material properties um, explicitly in this standard. There are many implicit ones. Um, in, in which case, you know, this is going to be adopted a little bit differently depending on the material stock that you have available. And one of the advantages of bamboo, obviously, or one of the, the, the issues with bamboo, obviously, is it's going to be very um, regional specific or national specific. And so one would anticipate seeing um, additional annexes added to these um, uh, based on sound legal adoption when, once they're adopted by the countries. I'd like to add something else to Kent's uh, and Lucy's answer is that there is a lot we don't know about bamboo in terms of species. And as Kent has pointed out, there's a variety of species around the world that haven't been studied with great rigor. So one of the things the standard tells you is go away and do some research uh, and point you what to do with that data once you've done that research. Uh, so it helps you, it tells you how to derive characteristic values in terms of properties. And the other thing it tells you, though we outline some procedures of how to design connections, really we sort of tell you, go and test them. Um, and we require you to consider it. One of the things that I'm maybe jumping ahead here, but it, it really is pointing you the direction of, 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 of testing is because we are encouraging to make sure that your connections behave in a certain manner. Uh, and um, hence, we really, unless you have already researched the material in great rigor, you would probably have to go and find the answers to these questions. Yeah, David, uh, let me add something. Uh, that's, I mean, to complete the, the, the topic. Is uh, you 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 reach uh, you you say a very good thing about the species and that's true. Right now there is not too many species. Actually, we have in Americas we have the guadua very well studied. In Southeast Asia we have the bambusa blumeana. We are trying here in the laboratory to research more about other species. But the truth is, if you are in India, for example and they have a wonderful species there, you cannot find too many uh, information about Indian bamboo to design with the standard. So again, the laboratories, the universities has to produce that information uh, to uh, to them to be able to use the, the standard. Hey, Andrew, over to you, another question. Hey. So now, one thing that really struck me was that, that there's clearly been a decision to follow allowable or permissible design methods. Um, now, I found that quite interesting because one could effectively most other codes in the world are actually in the process of moving across or have moved across to limit state design. So can you help us understand the, the reason for that decision? That's one for you, Kent. Honestly, it goes back to data. Um, I, I, I limit state design um, really requires significant data to establish the reliability aspects of, of, of a limit state design, whether it's partial safety, whether it's the partial safety factors come together for a particular reliability, or in North American context, the load of resistance factors come together to establish a particular reliability that requires extensive data. Um, in order to calibrate that reliability. Um, using an allowable stress approach is a, a, a obviously a, from an engineering perspective, a very straightforward approach. It's a well-established approach. And I think it suits the use of bamboo well in the same way that in, at least um, for those of you not familiar, in North American steel practice, we still permit allowable stress approaches and in many types of design, and particularly simple structures, trust design, allowable stress actually 
um, produces a slightly more efficient design as a result. Um, but the primary reason we went that way is that there simply isn't the data, and I'm not really confident that we could discuss uh, a partial safety factor approach with all of the variables that we have, and particularly the different species um, globally. I mean, Guadua does behave a little bit differently than a Moso, than a than a than an Asper, and things like that. And and so I think that we just had um, it, it's a it's almost a big data problem um, that we are not able to solve just yet. Hopefully, we're moving in that direction. Can Can I say something? Uh, I think uh, to to answer also the question of Andrew and uh, give credit to the answer of of, of Kent. Uh, I just give you an example. In in Colombia, we have a standard for design uh, before the ISO. Uh, the first standard for for bamboo was in two thousand and nine for wildlife structures, and we use the the database that was available at that time to determine the characteristic value. So I will give you an example for compression with the database available in 2009. We determine a characteristic value of around, uh, if I am not wrong, 24 megapascals. And that was what we use in the standard. So right now the standard is under revision and we have a huge database now with more tests and the characteristic value just jump to 36 to 37 megapascal. So that's why we are not completely sure about the, 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 the data until we don't have more tests. So I think the allow stress design is, is more safe for now. Yeah, I would like to add something to that. And that is um, with a limit state design code, you have to understand both sides of the equation as well. So you know your loads, and you and the factors applied to your loads, and you know on the right-hand side, the factors applied to the materials. We don't have an appreciation yet of, shall we say, the left-hand side, because in each jurisdiction, there might be different load factors. So that was also a, another consideration for going for allowable. Now, and Kent, this is... Oh, I think oh, Seb wants to add something. You put your microphone. Hi, sorry. Could you can you hear me now? Sorry. Uh, yes. It, um, if I could just add to that, we do actually permit uh, limit state design in the annex, even though it's not the uh, default approach. So, if some designers wish to use limit state design, uh, they can, and we've given some guidance on that. Okay. Now, Kent, I noticed, uh, and you you mentioned this in your introduction that okay. the uh, no, no, no. buildings. Um, what's what's the reason for that? It's a consensus document, um, and and as we all know, consensus documents tend to to fall to the lowest common denominator. It's what we felt comfortable with. Um, as I, as I mentioned a couple of times, there's a lot of experiential work now coming into this. And that's the experience that we were comfortable with. And so one and two story structures, seven meters um, was, was, was felt to be appropriate. Um, I feel reasonably confident that we could extend beyond that, but I wouldn't want to, to push the limit too much simply because there's not a great deal of experience as we go beyond that. Um, I think there's also a little bit of an aspect, and, and Matteo may be able to, to comment on this, is generally we've limited it to, to structures that are not going to require extensive fire protection. Um, once you get above two stories, things like that, things start changing. Um, and, and that was a concern um, as well. Um, but the short answer is it's a consensus document and we've got to get um, however many I forget how many voting countries there are on, on TC-165, but there's a number of them, and we've got to get them all lined up and marching in the same direction. And, and this was what we were able to do at this point. I have no doubt, or at least I, I have a sincere hope that the next revision will be able to expand the scope a little bit. Matteo, do you want to elaborate something on, on, uh, on fire? 
Yeah, yeah. Thanks, David. I, if I um, remember well, uh, when we start the discussion about the uh, update of ISO 22156, that was one of the first questions that were raised at that time. And, um, and obviously fire was a big concern and, and we didn't have much data uh, five years ago. We didn't know exactly how will bamboo perform at elevator temperatures and under fire uh, conditions. So the safest um, approach that we took at that time was just to limit the application to two stories because we knew that uh, buildings can be quickly evacuated and the um, structural adequacy or, or structural integrity um, will not be required to provide a, a fire safety. Um, so in, in a, in a two-story building, uh, people can easily evacuate without compromising uh, life safety. And, 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 and obviously that will give us like a, the, the safety levels that we wanted to achieve with this, with this standard. Um, I will say that uh, with the information that is available uh, these days, uh, it, it probably um, we still don't know all the answers if we want to go higher and if we require um, a building to achieve certain uh, fire resistance. So that's probably uh, still remains as one of the main um, research gaps in this, in this document. I would also point out that generally that's going to be an issue for national codes as well. And so a national code could adopt this and, and revise the scope um, and it could revise it down. I could imagine an adoption that says one story only as an example. Um, and, and so the fire safety issue is, is, is an issue for national codes. It's certainly not an issue for a material specific um, standard. I just want to add uh, that, uh, as Kent said also in the beginning of the presentation, this standard is not writing in stone. It's a live document and it will change in the future. So, in, for example, in BASE, we are starting a project of researching about three-story uh, shear wall uh, bamboo construction. Actually, together with Sebastian, we are planning to to do that uh, that project uh, and, and we hope to find nice results. We know for a fact that it's possible to make, we know also from Chirwal's uh, historical constructions in Colombia that goes to five story and that, but we need to understand better how we are going to deal with fire as uh, Mateo was saying and, and other aspects of, uh, of the designs we want to explore in the coming researches. And if the results are good, we can uh, pr propose a revision of the ISO 22156 in the near future. Thank you. Now, there was one word kept coming up in the standard, which is something that I, 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 if I compare it with timber standards across the world, I don't see, and that was the word redundancy. Um, in, specifically in relation to, to sort of bamboo, what, what, what are we talking about when we talk about redundancy and why is that relevant specifically to bamboo design? I'm, I'm going to um, venture I, to start with this one and then you can complement it. The, the concern we had when we proposed the word redundancy so often was uh, around splitting. So this is Kent pointed out that uh, we have it's a material specific in that respect. Bamboo combs tend to split. And the implications of splitting uh, are not fully understood and potentially species specific. Um, initial indications seem that some species are more susceptible and the effects are more serious. So because we don't fully understand this aspect and we know it does split. We thought that by ensuring that there is a redundancy of elements, uh, should a split occur, you have uh, remaining levels of safety in the structure, but also the means to replace an element that has a seriously large split in it uh, in a manner that you don't have to prop the whole structure to replace it. You just remove the split one, put the other one in, might have to do some jacking or something, but nothing significant. And that allows to ensure that you have a way to repair any 
split that might occur. I don't know if one, Kent wants to add anything to that. I, I will, I will, like I, like you asked, I will compliment that response. That was a very good response. <laughs> So th there was also reference, and I, I think, David, this is what you alluded to a little earlier, um, that the code requires connections to be ductile. Um, is, is, that, is that also related to the splitting behavior? Uh, this is not only down to, only to that. Bamboo uh, is a material that exhibits many brittle failure modes. Potentially, I think, to my knowledge, the only uh, failure mode that is uh, more or less ductile it is a compression of short members. Everything else is a, a brittle failure mode. You would, could say that's similar to timber, but timber at least has compression perpendicular also exhibiting some ductility. Um, so in order to ensure safety in the structure, you have to find ductility elsewhere, and this is going to be in its connections. Um, and so we want to ensure that somewhere in the system incorporates some ductility and that would be necessarily in the connections. Thank you. Um, and uh, I, I suppose that the, the final aspect I came across, which I wasn't expecting, there was a section on called experience from previous generations. What's, what's that alluding to? Kent, do you want to elaborate or someone else? Said. Um, I, I can start, and I think that we've got a, a number of people here who can probably add to that. Um, one, that is a legacy um, section that um, I think fits very, very well. Um, so that was in the two, 2004 version, and, and this was a revision, and we felt that it was, it was rational to keep that. There is an awful lot of, and I, I don't quite know if vernacular is the right word, but um, established vernacular type of construction methods using bamboo that work. And they may have been working for hundreds of years in many cases, um, um, safely supporting the loads they need to do and, and that the structures, typically residential structures, um, um, are satisfying the needs of the users. Um, we shouldn't be throwing that out. We shouldn't be throwing out the, the, the experience of the, of, uh, decades of art, 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 artisanal experience. In order, though, to use and in order to 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 trigger that and and use um, uh, that approach, we do define some fairly strict guidance in terms of what is um, uh, uh, what what experience is acceptable. Um, in as far as if I built something very successfully for decades in one particular location, I can't just up and move that to another location because it's not going to necessarily have the same materials, the same artisans available and so forth. Um, so there has to be a sort of chain of, of, of um, oh, I've just lost the word I wanted to use. Um, uh, there, there has to be a chain of knowledge as it were um, that also is going forward, so we know how we're going to repair, maintain, and, 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 and keep these particular structures. And I'll use an absolutely ludicrous example. Um, a structure that works very, very well in, in one particular location might be an igloo. Well, very clearly, an igloo does not transfer to other regions particularly well, particularly tropical ones. Um, but we didn't want to lose that um, uh, we, we didn't want to lose that experience and bury it or, or, or not recognize that it does have value. A huge amount of the work, I can only speak personally here, a, a huge amount of the work that I have done in, in looking at engineering round comb bamboo is really trying to put some engineering to methods and approaches that we have seen have worked and have worked maybe for centuries in some cases. So I think anybody else wants to, to, to chime in on that. It's a, it, it, that, that's more of a bit of a, a, a passionate object. I, I, I would like to add something. Um, and it was that we, that section we added very little. It came from 2004. The only thing we kept added a couple of lines in terms of that 
the the size of the structure should not be extrapolated. So um, if the experience of, uh, of structures was building structures of a houses of a span of three meters by three meters, for example, then you can't sort of argue, say, well, this would work for a space of six by six meters uh, because it, 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 this is where traditional techniques uh, don't have the same capacity as using proper engineering. Uh, and this is valid for any technology, not just bamboo, really. Yeah, I, I will say from, from my, my side that, uh, of course, Colombia has a building code with bamboo since, for bareque since 2002, and for bamboo structures since 2010. So most of the information there, I think the structure I think in my case help a lot in the in the in the development of the ISO 22156. And I think we we don't use the the standard from Colombia, but I think we get some inspiration from that standard as well. Thank you. Um, perhaps I could move us on now to the section on durability. Um, I think obviously really important, and I think for me durability goes hand in hand with sustainability. It's just so important to design structures which are going to last a long time. Um, and, and just to put that section in context, I mean, uh, a question people often have, which is how durable is bamboo against insects, against fungus? Well, I'm pretty sure that Seb is itching to answer that question. Thanks, David. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, yes, so good question. So um based on what we've seen um bamboo unfortunately is particularly susceptible to um so three different types of attack and you could you could broadly say it's as susceptible as the most susceptible timbers that's what we've seen um and it's because of the lack of natural toxins which some timbers have for example oak has a lot of natural toxins which helps to protect against certain types of attack timber as far as we know doesn't take Bamboo, as far as we know, doesn't have any of those natural toxins. That makes it particularly susceptible to beetle, termite, and rot attacks. Um, and so and what we've seen is that traditionally, there's a lot of really good knowledge about how people design um, for thousands of years against those forms of attack. That sort of knowledge is being uh, lost, unfortunately. And, and with a lot of modern designs, people are um, forgetting some of these forms of attack. And some of them don't occur on day one. They occur later down the line, only after five or 10 years. So the designer may not necessarily learn about those attacks, only the, the homeowners will. And so what we've tried to do in the code, we've tried to bring that, uh, that not the knowledge that we have forward into a much clearer uh, method to say specifically where bamboo can and can't be used depending on different exposure conditions, and especially against rot, which is one of those forms of attack that definitely doesn't occur on day one. It's something which people only realize after a few years, and we see quite a lot of issues on. And are there, so if you say that bamboo has limited durability, are, are there ways that it can be treated to make it more durable? Okay, so uh, these are the three forms of attack that I mentioned. We've got beetle attack, and you can see beetle exit halls here in bamboo. Termite attack, which could be quite rapid, and you can see the amount of damage that you can see, and that's often hidden. It's hidden behind the thin layer of um, thin layer of material that the term, that subterranean termites leave on the outside to protect them against um, UV. Um, and then rot attack. You can see this piece of timber. You can see that the fu the, uh, the fungi is concentrated um, around the uh, sapwood, whereas the hard heartwood, which is where the timber deposits its uh, toxins is actually quite resistant to uh, fungal attack. Uh, but bamboo, unfortunately, doesn't have any of that toxins, which makes it very um, susceptible. And this is rot um, attack in uh, bamboo that's been um, exposed. So the way we've, um, we've approached this in um, ISO 22156 is to say that um, one needs to firstly um, treat bamboo and that protects against termites and beetles. And in addition to that, protects against moisture. And that's moisture from the ground, 
moisture from driving rain and any other forms of moisture. So what we've said is that you need a good waterproof envelope, you need to elevate the structure above ground and protect against driving rain and any area where bamboo is exposed to driving rain, then it, um, it has a reduced design life. And in terms of treatment, in response to your question, Andrew, what we found is boron is actually the best form of treatment. It's used um, internationally. It's a very effective, very safe form of treatment. And you can see that while untreated bamboo doesn't last particularly long, the moment you treat it and you keep it dry, while well, you're comfortably up to 30, um, 30, 40, 50, 60 year design life. So there are methods to make bamboo structures very durable if you treat them properly and design them properly to protect against moisture. And so are there different chemicals that can be used to treat the bamboo? So boron, we think, is uh, the most appropriate that we've seen uh, because it's it's safe, it's um, quite cost effective, available in most countries as basically a fertilizer. The downside is it washes out. So because it washes out, you have to keep the bamboo dry. There are alternatives. Um, copper is one. It's not used in um, in mass scale at the moment, um, but it's quite effective. It's just much more expensive. And the downside is that you can't burn copper treated bamboo, so you have to dispose of it correctly. All the other chemicals, well, there are a few other chemicals as well, which have potential, but most of the other chemicals really tend to be quite nasty toxic chemicals to humans. And because we're talking about structures that are built in developing countries, but a majority of these, uh, we need to consider the risk to human and animal life throughout the entire, uh, throughout all phases of the treatment of the bamboo. So in some cases, if you're treating bamboo, you need to think who's actually going to be treating it. Will they be wearing the right uh, protective equipment? Um, during installation, during use, and um, end of life, any off cuts, what are they going to they be used for firewood? Are the people going to be breathing that in? How are you going to dispose of that? How are you going to dispose of the of the waste liquid? And because of that, boron is the is the one chemical, the the best chemical that we've seen internationally so far, and um, to treat uh, bamboo. There are a few others, but boron is generally considered the, the most appropriate. I'd, I'd like to just add to that, if I may. Um, there is a lot of interesting work going on right now at, at looking at, um, shall we say, green methods of treatment. Um, citric acid is, is one that's being looked at. Um, uh, I am not a chemist and I'm not going to get into all of the details, but there is a lot of effort right now being put to find um, more pleasant alternatives for treatment. And they, these treatments would also be uh, uh, applicable to timber as well. And if I can add something else is um, that we have also addressed uh, moisture content with the service classes. So, uh, and somehow if we manage to um, um, understand the environmental conditions in the place where the structure is going to be built, uh, we can somehow predict what will be the moisture content of bamboo and make sure that that moisture content is below uh, 20%. So it's the structure is less likely to be attacked by insects and 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 fungi. So yeah, the service classes will help us with with durability as well. Yes, uh, I, may I have something? So uh, here in, in Philippines, we we try to to find alternatives for treatment, and what uh, thing we are doing in, in with our partners in the treatment facility is add a, 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 an additional step in the treatment process that is put the bamboos just in fresh running water for a couple of days, three, four days. And with that, we can extract as much we can the, 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 um, the starch because of most of the powder beetles like that uh, particular ingredient. So we can remove most of the starch, but still we have to deal with the uh, with the termites, no? So we have to do a treatment with chemicals. We don't use borax here in the Philippines. We use perimetrine, that is a different uh, toxic thing, but uh, very well managed and accepted in the whole world. 
uh, and and then but doing the step of the removing of the starch we can uh, at the end use less chemical concentration so that also helps a lot to don't use uh, a lot of uh, chemical uh, solutions thank you the so perhaps I could move us on to temperature and also fire. Um, now, I can see that there's a temperature factor in in the code. Um, so I'd like to understand a bit more about that, and particularly because it's not something that not all timber codes, for example, have a temperature factor in. Um, I know the um, American one does, but the European one doesn't. So it'd be interesting to understand a bit more about that. That's that's one for Mateo, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. I actually can't. I saw you uh, had a couple of slides uh, with those tests. Um, so when yeah, I'm when sure, sure. Start, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, that that's perfect. That's that's the slide that I was <laughs> thinking of. Um, when we uh, start the discussion about the effects of uh, elevated temperature. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have uh, much data um, available, but uh, fortunately enough, um, and we um, had the chance to look at the results of the research that I conducted in the last uh, years, um, we, we could uh, see the impact of elevated temperatures and we saw that um, there is a significant reduction in the uh, mechanical properties, not only a reduction in the strength, but also reduction in the ductility of the material. And as David mentioned before, um, bamboo in compression, that's probably the only uh, property where bamboo is ductile and the elevated temperature will have a negative effect um, on that property. So in that, in that uh, plot there, you can see the reduction uh, in compression and the reduction in tension at elevated temperatures. And you can see that at 100 degrees, um, the reduction in compression is almost 70%, which is very significant. Um, and that's quite similar to what it has been observed in, in timber as well. So we use these uh, test results to kind of back up uh, the factors that we included in the code. And, and obviously what we decided uh, to put as a, as a threshold was this 65 degrees. So when we, when we are, when we have a structure that is above 65 degrees, we think that the reduction is very, very significant and, and we shouldn't be, um, like you um, designing structures that will be subjected to a permanent temperature that is higher than that uh, value. Now, in, in a fire condition, you're obviously going to have way higher temperatures than that. Um, and obviously, when we think about timber, because of the size of the members and because of the um, ability of timber to produce char, you somehow are going to protect the, the the residual section, right? Like the inner uh, core of your cross section. But in bamboo, it's completely different because the, the walls are very thin. So there is no way to create such a um, protective layer. So we believe that it's safer to um, just don't expose bamboo um, to fire because there is no way to create such a sharp um, effect. So, and, and looking at these graphs here at 200, 250 degrees, the strength is completely lost. So yeah, it's, it's a bit different to what we are used to think of um, timber members. Thank you. That's, that's, that's really, that's really helpful. Um, now, perhaps, uh, th th there was one, I, I was expecting the code just to cover bamboo culls, but actually I see there's a whole section on composite bamboo shivels. Um, they, I wonder if you could explain um, what they are and um, where, 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 where they're used. Okay, 
I, I know Seb and Luis will be very keen to expand on this. I just want to say one small thing about this. And why we introduced it was because this is a method of construction that uses bamboo that had demonstrated to be very successful. And we thought it seems uh, pointless not to include it here and not share with the world a very effective method. And then I, I'll say no more and let them elaborate. Yeah, so I think uh, what you say is, is correct, David. Uh, um, the history uh, shows that the, 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 the sheer wall systems with bamboo work very well, especially in the coffee region in Colombia and Ecuador and, and uh, even in Peru and other countries in Latin America. And, and uh, very seismic prone areas, by the way. And for a, for a long time, these constructions have a, a relatively good behavior with some problems with durability and other things that uh, because we're vernacular constructions. But uh, when in 2000, the Colombian uh, Association of uh, Earthquake Engineering decided to research this, this uh, topic and include in the building code and later on, some projects start to be built in Colombia using this system. I think that was actually a good a good experience and also help us to understand better the behavior of the system. So it's a system that use bamboo. It's not an entire bamboo construction as we think. It's a, a hybrid system that use bamboo as a, a structural component, but um, it has so many advantages for housing, especially in the tropics for social housing. It's easy to build, it's, it's, it's cheap, uh, it's, uh, the behavior is, is uh, average. So I mean, I, when I say average, it's that you, you can predict easily the, the behavior of the structure, so it's predictable. And, uh, and this is, it's, it's easy to design. So, so uh, the system should be in the, in the standard because also the standard should be used in tropical countries to, to solve uh, social housing problems, I think. Seb, you want to add something? Yeah, no, if, if that, that was that was really good. Just to add to that, so this system, it's been, as, as Luis has said, it's been traditionally used. Um, a traditional version of the system has been used in uh, many countries in Latin America, and Colombia um, arguably has the, the most advanced um, technology of this system, although other countries had their own sort of versions. And then Columbia introduced this um, this code for this improved vernacular type system where they started to engineer some of the connections and, and improve some of the details. Um, and Columbia still has that code. Um, it's now also been introduced in, in Ecuador. But since then, a number of other countries are actually, through different programs, have had similar systems um, constructed. So um, as well as Ecuador, Colombia, um, Peru, also Honduras, uh, El Salvador, big project in Costa Rica, um, the Philippines with, um, through Luis's project, and now also Nepal. So what we're trying to do here is, um, with, in this international code, we've tried for the first time to bring this technology to an international standardized perspective. And we hope again, this section will be improved and maybe in the future, it'll become its own code as well to try and encourage people to use it on an international scale. Yeah, I, I would comment. I know one thing that we've talked a lot amongst ourselves is that I think that this is the chapter that will probably in the next version um, likely fall from this code and be created in a new code of its own because I think it definitely is mature enough and, and that would be a very appropriate goal. And I think more useful to the community potentially. Um. I, I would just say, I think we are getting close to the uh, uh, allocated time. So Andrew, if you probably have maybe one or two last questions. The, uh, I, I think we've got through the list actually. So um, I was actually going to see if there were any questions from the audience um, at all. Yes, well, that is, uh, brings us to the end of this session and we'll pass on to the audience. So many thanks to Andrew for his incisive and well-considered questions. Many thanks to Joseph Lansang from Base Baha'i for producing this session. And many thanks to my fellow Task Force Met colleagues, as well as fellow ISO 22156 contributors 
for sharing their knowledge and explaining so clearly the thinking behind the standard. Hopefully, this session has clarified many aspects and whetted your curiosity and interest in the standard. We will now open the floor to the audience to address more questions you may have. I also take the opportunity, Kent has already mentioned it, uh, to announce that this team is working on, uh, with Institutional Structural Engineers in the production of a design manual to ISO 22156-2021, which is due, hopefully, to the latter part of 2022. And bye for now, and thank you very much for joining us. Great, uh, great, uh, David, and uh, all the all the panelists. Who, it was wonderful uh, discussion as well as the presentation of the standards, and uh, and I hope all the participants would have benefited from the whole process. So, in the interest of time, I will give the floor to my co-moderator, Dr. Emmanuel, to continue with the question and answer session. Probably in the interest of time, we would have around 40 minutes of the question and answers. So, I encourage all the participants to, um, to type in the question so that Dr. Manuel can uh, fish out the questions and uh, pose the questions to the panelists. So once again, many thanks to all the panelists for the wonderful presentation and for the, the panel discussion. So Dr. Emmanuel, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, Zirai. A great presentation by the team, the expert panel, uh, David and the team also well moderated by Andrew. Uh, we participants have lots of questions. We so far received a number of them. In the course of the panel discussions, a number of them were answered. And I believe uh, some people will need some light to tune more on some issues. For instance, uh, Richard wanted to know does the standard apply to all bamboo species? I think this was discussed, but uh, maybe one of the panel uh, members, uh, Kent or David, want to confirm again that the standard apply to all bamboo species. Uh, someone wants that clarification. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Um, the standard was intentionally written to be species agnostic. Um, and the intent then would be that national annexes would address appropriate species, um, both permissive and species that maybe you don't want to use locally for whatever reason, durability and so forth. Um, and that is the intent. So no, there is no um, no species specific uh, no species specific issues um, within the standard as it as it is. That does imply the need then as it's adopted um, nationally for that information to be, uh, uh, to be added in an annex of some kind. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Harris. Uh, I feel that was concise and straightforward. We need to uh, adopt to our country's specific species. That will lead me to a question uh, by Rito from Indonesia. Uh, who says that uh, we are preparing Indonesian bamboo standard. Can we use the ISO standard as a reference uh, document? I presume that's what he means. Uh, we are preparing a national standard in Indonesia. Can they use the ISO standard as the reference? I'm happy to chip in in this one, if you don't mind, Kent. Uh, yes, that's the intention. the intention. This document has been created as uh, the basis for you to build a new standard and don't start from zero. Um, the idea is you pick up what we've produced so that um, you start from a low position of collective knowledge that has been accumulated by the task force members. Um, it, it, it reflects experience uh, in construction, experimental outcomes. So it, it, if you start from scratch and 
say, no, we're not going to read that document. You're wasting, you know, an opportunity. We put in, created this document for that purpose because in reality, ISO 22156 does not have a national jurisdiction. Um, you can't really go and design with it until it's been incorporated to a national code. So we, we are working with people around the world to, to make them international standards. So yeah, please, I invite uh, those people from Indonesia, from the team from Indonesia to look into ISO 2216, uh, and if they have any questions, that they contact us. And, and, and I would add, uh, I'd like to just add to that, that this has a lot to do with how national standards are adopted. And I must admit, I'm not familiar exactly what happens in Indonesia, but many, many countries can adopt ISO standards directly, um, uh, uh, jurisdictionally, excuse me, uh, d directly. Some countries cannot. I live in the United States. We do not adopt ISO standards directly. We have our own um, standards writing organizations. And so you might want to look at the individual country and maybe somebody can fill in um, what the Indonesian system is. I know they do some of their own standards. I don't know if they're a member of ISO and, and can adopt directly um, ISO standards. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, David and Kent. Well, that's also clear. Uh, member countries, especially of ISO, can adopt the uh, standards and also adapt. There's a question on the, the treatment that the preservatives. Uh, Lydia Samoa asks, are there preservatives for bamboo or are the preservatives for bamboo environmentally friendly? That's environmental friendliness of the preservatives. I think uh, it was earlier mentioned that bone seems to be the best form of treatment. And, uh, Louise, which also mentioned other forms used. Uh, so uh, you can throw more light on it, the environmental yeah. cleanliness of the preservatives. Thank you. I Should wonder I if jump in there? Sebastian, yeah, I wonder if you're. A um, hi, yeah, so good question. So, first question on the um, is it, are there environmentally forms of treatment? Um, so far, we think that born is probably the most environmentally friendly in general because it's, it's a natural product. Um, it's low toxicity um, to humans and to, um, and to animal life. Um, so at the moment, it's the most effective treatment, which is still generally quite, has, has generally quite low um, environmental impact. Um, as, uh, as Kent mentioned in the, in the video, there are um, alternatives, alternatives being looked at at the moment, but so far to my knowledge, None are none have proven to be very effective. Someone else has also asked if seawater can be used to immunize bamboo. Um, I haven't seen any rigorous studies in seawater against in salt water against uh, fresh water. We do know that water will wash out the starch, the sugars in bamboo, which makes it less attractive to beetles. So it will definitely help. It won't protect against rot, and it won't really protect against termites. So I think we can hypothesize the same with seawater. Um, it will help against beetles, but it's not really going to help against rot or termites. All right, thank you very much. Now we want to uh, also look at an issue raised by Lydia. Lydia wants to know if parameters such as MOL, MOE, uh, which are analyzed on GN bamboo, so that's done on the raw bamboo combs, uh, if it's not done, how they have proposed let the ideas to ship of construction? Uh, if the question of this is All right, so I tell the question again, uh, David or Ken. Yeah, uh, I, I saw the question. Thank you. Um, yeah. Sorry, just uh, there was an interruption there. Yeah, and there's an interruption again. So I, I, I saw the question. I didn't completely understand it when, when it was posted. 
it was uh, suggested that we were only establishing modulus elasticity and um, other properties with laminated bamboo and not for calm bamboo. Um, I, I don't know if that's what I interpreted the question to be, but I think that's um, inaccurate. Um, uh, we, we've been determining mechanical properties of bamboo for both laminated products as well as for round calm elements. In fact, the ISO standards that um, Kent mentioned are solely for calm bamboo. Um, we are working in some engineered bamboo standards, test, uh, testing standards and so forth, but they haven't been pub published yet. So um, what is ISO 22157, ISO 22156, and ISO 19624 are solely for bamboo columns. Exactly, David, uh, that's it. So, Vidya, uh, uh, it's, it's clear that we have the parameters MO, RMO is determined for both uh, raw palm bamboos as well as for engineered bamboo products. So, uh, it cannot be correct that we only determine for engineered bamboo. We determine for both the raw palm as well. Right, then uh, there was also an issue uh, raised by Martin uh, on this conservationism, on this reservations on the use of limit state design and calculating uh, using bamboo as a natural material. I don't know if you have any comments on it. I think uh, with the type of design, whether it's limit state or not, Martin says he has reservations uh, as the experts brought any comments on. Kent, do you want to? I'm sorry, I'm having a really hard time hearing you, Emmanuel. I, I did not understand the question. Maybe we have to type it, I'm not certain. I was saying that uh, Martin, as, as an architect, is hesitating to apply the limited design calculations to natural material like bamboo, as opposed to manufacturing structural members. Uh, you know, if you have any uh, comment on that. I'm, I'm trying to find the comment. I apologize. This was Mark yeah. Tam. Well I will chip in while you find the common Kent. Um, no, you can use limit state design codes with natural materials. The, the Euro code five is written around t for timber and it's written for limit state code uh, conditions. And um, the American uh, NSD, MBS, sorry. Um, you can you can use LR, LRFD, LRFD, which is for timber as well. So um, there's no reason why we couldn't, in principle, eventually use it for bamboo. It's just um, as we present recorded in our presentation, there's a series of reasons why uh, limit state codes or LRFD are not probably appropriate. I don't know if there's a delay or David, you just shut out. Yeah, I think David is gone off. Uh, the speaker went off. Yeah. I'm here still, I think. Okay. All right. I, I, I found the comment. I apologize. Um, yeah, Martin is had to hesitate to apply limit state calculations to natural materials, and I would generally agree. The concept of limit states design, whether it's low to resistance factor design, partial safety design, and what have you is to establish a reliability. And you get that a reliability against failure. And you get that reliability by pulling the, two, as David said in the, in the recording, the two sides of the equation together, the load factor side and the material factor side. When we're dealing with natural materials, we need to be a little bit careful because of the level, the, the degree of variability, um, particularly on the material factor side. And there may be some differences the way we wanna treat the load factor side. So to use a limit states approach, you really do need a lot more data than we presently have
for most bamboo. There certainly would be, um, you know, certain types of certain species of bamboo from certain regions where we have more than enough data to establish a limit states approach. But that does take the data. And I think I mentioned this in the recording as well. This is really a big data problem. This, this is massive, um, especially if we start talking about multiple species, let's say a dozen species or so, and, and it becomes um, rather intractable. Um, so that's really the reason that, that I would tend to agree with Martin when I'm dealing with natural materials, I tend to think about an allowable stress approach because it makes me feel a little bit better as an engineer. And I'm a good belt and suspenders kind of engineer. I, uh, the belt fails, I want my suspenders to be there. Does that answer the I question? Not, Sorry. I think Martin will be okay. Uh, it's just a lot of on uh, Sure, you can get the other side of it, right? There is an interesting question. Um, it says, where can I get bamboo corn that is ready to use and has reference design values as a safe construction material? In other words, uh, for the bamboo being stress graded, uh, just like uh, timber ready for use. Is there, do we have any of such available? Where can I get bamboo corn that's ready for use? Well, that's a very important question. The reality is that um, alongside ISO 22156, um, in two year, in three years before, we published a standard ISO 20, uh, 19624, which was a framework to develop methods for grading. So the reality is that that standard is, um, as I said, a framework. It's, it's the scaffold of how you go about creating a grading system for bamboo. But it needs to be adapted and adopted nationally. So what I would invite people to do is to become familiar with ISO 19624 and um, pursue ways of developing in their own country um, uh, ways of developing grading for their local species. It's a chicken and egg situation. No one's gonna invest in creating grading of bamboo if there's no one interested in buying bamboo. <clears throat> so, um, but we have, what we decided we would start with is by creating the standards that would allow you to, to shape that market. So uh, there are some countries that already practice some form of grading. We are working with some companies who want to implement grading and so forth. Um, but the reality is that uh, this is gonna be a, 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 a gradual process where we need researchers to start maybe taking this be at the forefront of helping companies grade them, uh, develop grading rules, which can be very simple by the way, um, um, for their bamboo and then gradually refine them. Thank you, uh, David. Okay. I think, uh, the, the ISO 19624 2018 with these bamboo structures, grading of bamboo, is also available. Uh, participants can uh, try and get it. Uh, then we try to adapt to uh, country situation. Uh, so it's a good chance really to develop uh, or find our own uh, species and then grade them. Uh, before you can have a uh, graded bamboo for construction. There's no way you can go and find one such shop to find all uh, bamboo graded uh, material for construction. All right, thank you. We move on. There's a question on the best form of uh, form treatment. So the question was, I, isn't the best form of bamboo palm treatment simply cutting it at the right time, uh, in the right place, and then and if you get this part, you have after harvesting. If you get it wrong, does it make the brush treatment so you have less effective? So I think uh, Sebastian he wants to know if at the time of harvest, if you get it wrong, does it make the uh, brush treatment so you can be less effective? Okay, yeah, um, um, good question. Um, this, this is actually a common misconception. So 
Um, harvesting at the right time just changes the sugar and the water content of the bamboo, and it makes it more or less susceptible to beetle attack, which is the first form of attack. And beetles are particularly attracted to the starch, and it's the first thing that you'll see when you harvest bamboo. Changing the sugar content or the water content doesn't really help against long-term rot or termite attack. So it really doesn't influence that. Um, and once you've injected a chemical such as boron into your bamboo, then whether or not your sugar content is high or low shouldn't really make a difference. Um, so I, I think it, it's a common misconception based on truth. But if you're looking for, you're looking for a product which is reliably durable against beetles, termites, and rot, then treating it with boron is the only um, effective uh, chemical, really, only effective method. And you still always have to keep it dry. So there's just one other question that I point that I, that I picked out that someone said, um, if, you're, um, if you have processed bamboo, all these insect problems do not exist. That's not, not correct, unfortunately. Um, bamboo, whether it's processed or not, will rot and you have to keep it dry. So you've got to treat it and keep it dry at the same time. The two have to go hand in hand. You can't just treat. Thank you very much for your clarification. Um, there is uh, a question also that is uh, for Luis Felipe, specifically in the uh, Investigation, construction, or building of brick walls, of composition walls. Uh, you know, if you have seen this particular comment or question, uh, the issue is that is there separation of shear walls, and do they have limits to allow to do performance of the floor system? So, issue of shear walls and then brick walls, uh, and if the first floor is more rigid and there's more thickness, uh, is there an unlikelihood uh, that to affect the performance of the floor system? I'm not sure if Felipe you are clear with this uh, question. Yeah, I, I think Luis Felipe has uh, gone to bed. So I don't know if Seb wants to answer that question. Sebastian? Yes, I'm just reading the question. Um, I didn't quite follow the question. It was it that the um, was it whether the foot, the the shields have to be more more rigid to have good performance. I, I think yeah. I think in in general. So yes, you'd need more walls on on ground floor, not thicker walls, because the composite the composite system has um, a certain thickness of wall which doesn't really change. We can't make it thicker or thinner. It's a certain thickness. So the strength per unit length of wall stays the same. What you can do is just add more walls. And yes, on the, on the ground floor, you would need more walls because your overall shear in an earthquake is, is higher. Um, and there is guidance in the Andean standard for how many walls you need. The wall density for different um, seismic zones in Peru and Colombia and Ecuador. Right. If I can add to that, Seb, I think looking at the, the question, we also need to recognize as structural engineers the interaction between the walls and the diaphragm, the floor action. And so there does become an issue with making sure that the floor can actually transmit the, 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 the seismic loads to the, to the wall systems themselves, the floor acting as a diaphragm. And admittedly, I do not believe that's something that we've covered particularly well. I think you could design for it um, using 22156, but it has not been addressed necessarily specifically in 22156. And so that was my interpretation of that question. It was more of a diaphragm question. But then I'm a diaphragm guy, so I, I, that's, I read everything that way. Thank you for the response. Do you want to take a few more? We're looking at. Uh... Question by Jim, who wants to know if there's any data about uh, states or countries who offer incentives to bamboo growers or industry or artisans or craftsmen. Uh, I, I think it's very much outside of the scope of what 
this what panel of experts knows. Um, there might be somebody within Imbar that knows about tax incentives and so forth, but uh, we don't. This is outside of what we know. Right. And I think additional one for uh, Imba and organizers is uh, Amy requesting for floor study or hands on skills sets. Uh, uh, instead of virtual training, because it's such an interesting uh, information training, is there a possibility to have a hands on or a field, uh, a study in this uh, uh, seminar? I think that's uh, also for organizers to uh, look at. There's a question uh, on the gaps identified in the uh, standard development where areas for Further research. Uh, the question was Is there anywhere this has been documented where people can identify the gaps in the uh, standards where people can do research to fill those gaps? David, do you want that one or shall I? Uh, you can start off and then I'll chip in. Um, the standard itself doesn't specifically identify gaps. That's not the role of a standard and it actually has some issues when adopted as a code. Um, I believe that the effort that, that the group of us are putting together with the guide document that will be prepared uh, for later in 2022, um, I'll go out on a limb and suggest that it will conclude with a research needs section. Um, and so hopefully we will document that reasonably well um, there. And now, now, now that I've committed us to doing that, I'll throw it over to David for further comment. Sorry. Yeah. Um, but I would add to what Kent has said is that ISO 22156 is not written in the way that many other design standards or codes that you might have seen in the world work in, in the sense that they tell you, do this to design and obtain that outcome. Sometimes it sort of says, you need to go and do some research. For example, in the case of connections, it frequently says to you, you need to find these properties so that you can design the connection. These are the tests you need to undertake. So it, it identifies some research that you need to do so that you can go out and design with bamboo because the reality is for many bamboo species, we just simply do not know the answers. And as Kent pointed out much earlier in the questions, this is not written around a specific species of bamboo. Because what we could have done is just imagined, well, here's a standard, you must use these three species of bamboo and that's it. And that would have freed our hands to tell you a lot more specific guidance, but then uh, people would have turned around and said to us, well, what about my, my country? We have a different species. So what we're saying is go and research your species understand these but what the standard says it tells you what to do what questions you have to interrogate and so some of the gaps are identified in that respect <clears throat> so all i would suggest is read it right read it uh let it uh say um but are there any feedback mechanisms for users who say to contribute to this development mm -hmm. Sorry, M M Emmanuel? Uh, is there any feedback mechanism for users of the standard who seek to contribute to its development? That's uh, the other part of the question. No, I, 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 we, uh, let me see if I... I... I got it. So the question, David, was what, what if any, is the mechanism for uh, people to suggest revision and to contribute to future revisions. And I sincerely hope you can answer this because I don't understand ISO. Well, I, I think in the short term, send them to us in the short term. Um, I think what happens is the ISO mechanism is in five years time, uh, if I'm not wrong, the standard will be subject to a periodic review. Um, and Sometimes if, if both, well, if all of us and in the team are still willing to work with bamboo or not engaged in, I don't know what, with anything else, 
or we're still alive or any of those limitations, uh, we would like to see a revision made of the standards. So we would try to pick up people's comments. When it does come to revision, um, then the mechanism would be that your uh, standards body in your country makes the observations uh, and the, the observations are made then if you want to make it in a formal manner. If it's uh, from here until those that five years time or whatever it is, the, it comes for a, a, a revision period, then um, just send them to us. All right, so uh, I think we can directly contact uh, the team also uh, with the Umba Task Force on Bamboo uh, Construction, where all these aspects are. You can send your uh, comments directly. I think if you go to the website, you can give it as uh, a coordinator view. The way is also around uh, to follow the communication for this webinar. You can contact him by can wish with the uh, task force where these aspects are all available. Thank you very much. I think we have some few minutes left. Uh, and so, I will have maybe one or two more questions uh, for the team. Well, the next question is still with the limitation on the species and the specific countries, um, the, the limitation of species. Uh, I think that's already been answered because uh, each country will have its own species and the standard was not species specific. It was more in general terms. And so I'll pass that one. There's a question here. I'm trying to synthesize it uh, because the C is not uh, also too clear. All right, uh, uh, Kent, I think in the scope, you uh, mentioned that the scope is one to two story uh, residential buildings or small commercial buildings. Um, the one wants to know, does that mean if you really have the connections uh, to be able to add additional flood, is it you limited? Uh, So, so why was the scope limited? Is that the question? Yes. Um, again, this is a consensus document and we've got to make sure that everybody, who, who, however many countries, David can answer that, have to vote on it, have to be in agreement. Um, the data, both experiential and experimental, certainly supports one and two story structures. We, we put a, an arbitrary height to, to seven meters, which was practical. This also reflects um, the types of standards internationally um, where fire is not a particular issue, typically in one and two story structures, having multiple means of egress, uh, we don't need any other type of fire suppression or something like that. And that was the scope that we were comfortable working within. The document can be used as a guide, in my opinion, to go beyond that scope. But as a standard, we don't have the data yet to extend it. Uh, I think Luis Felipe mentioned that, you know, they're specifically working at moving to three stories, which is a, an interest. It's a good jump. It's an important jump. Um, and I don't know where that work uh, stands just at the moment. And I think, as, as David said, he may have uh, headed off to bed at this point. It's a little bit late. Um, so, so the scope in any standard, we need to recognize that any building construction standard that we deal with anywhere in the world is a lowest common denominator standard. It reflects essentially the lowest common denominator of the state of practice, not necessarily the state of the art. Yeah, this is a, it's a very interesting point and we, it was a long period of debate about where we felt comfortable, should we even include a, a, a limit in height? 
we felt that um, it was necessary to uh, identify to potential users, you know, let's walk before we run and uh, let's accumulate in different case countries sufficient uh, experience with the material to build confidence. Um, and, and that's where we felt that it, a, a limit that reflected um, what Kent has discussed was appropriate. I'll also point out the limit it reflects, um, for those of you uh, who are familiar with the I-Code series, the international codes, that limit is the, the differentiation between the International Residential Code, the IRC, and the International Building Code, the IBC, uh, has pretty much exactly the same um, differentiation in terms of form factor for the structure, not necessarily for use. We do permit uh, institutional, light industrial, things like that as well, which would go beyond the IRC. But it's the same concept of, of differentiating between the two. Thank you very much for your clarification. Uh, I think, interestingly, it was posted on the chat. Uh, those of you who are there, the participants' uh, publication by Gauss, Kaguta, and Harris, and Sebastiano on the modification of bamboo with citric acid, uh, the effect on the physical, chemical, mechanical, and thermal properties. Uh, I think we can have access to it to address issues on the preservation. Uh, and the environmental friendliness in some of these. Right. So I want to uh, think the time is up just about uh, three minutes. So I would want to hand over to uh, Dirai uh, for uh, the final closing uh, remarks, as well as from the uh, panelists. Uh, thank you very much. It's been very insightful. Lots of information shared on the ISO 22156. Uh, great overview by. Uh, and Paris, and then interesting answers uh, based on the comments and questions raised by participants. So I would want to hand over to Durai. Uh, thank you very much. Durai can take over from me. Great, like so many thanks, Manuel, for like some co-moderating and then uh, you excellently handling the question and answer session. Many thanks indeed for our contribution for this like some webinar. Uh, so we are coming to the end of the session and we have two closing words or the closing remarks. The first uh, closing remark is provided by David Trajello, who you know is the chair of the Inbar Construction Task Force, uh, followed by me providing uh, shorter uh, closing remarks. So uh, I invite I would try a lot to give his closing remarks, please. Thank you very much, Dirai. Earlier this month, I was fortunate enough to present at COP26 alongside two fellow task force members and the UIA. It was a great opportunity to extend our message to the world about the very significant role that bamboo may play in the race against climate change. This webinar series complements this message. And thank you for joining us today and participating with your considered and interesting questions. I also would like to invite you to act as replicators of this message. Bamboo is part of a solution. I take this opportunity also to thank our panel of speakers, Ken Harris, Luis Felipe Lopez, Sebastian Kaminsky, Mateo Gutierrez, and Andrew Lawrence. I thank Durai, Yaya Raman and Emmanuel Apia Kubi for the excellent role in moderating today's session, which made it a far more engaging event. I also wish to thank the team at Imbar who have facilitated and coordinated these five sessions on bamboo, a very sustainable construction material. I think you will agree with me that this has been a very successful and varied series. If we were in the room, we would be giving them a round of applause. So I'm going to give them an applause myself. Hopefully you compliment me as well. Thank you. Durai.
your microphone the right great sorry so great uh, great closing words since i have the liberty of time i can continue for some more time to provide the closing remarks i think uh, we had like wonderful series uh, today's webinar was great and as many of the participants who has followed the whole session the whole five uh, uh, the five training like some sessions i would agree with all of us the whole session was quite interesting uh, so this is the closing session as i have introduced previously uh, this session focused on the standardization of the round bamboo structure which is quite important uh, to close it is important to like recall from the beginning uh, in the previous year too we had the five session on the bamboo construction which was quite successful and that is the primary reason why we had again the construction focused like webinar in the year 2021 which was quite successful too we had around like 1000 people who were registered for the webinar and as like some five sessions uh, had around 2000 participants attending uh, the session so to to conclude it is uh, i think the, the the first session focused on the global bamboo architecture which showcased the important or the prominent uh, bamboo structures and the second session is on the technology and development of the contemporary bamboo structures in china in which focused only on the chinese uh, architecture design technology as well as the hybrid structures which was quite interesting and this can be applied to like other parts of the world as well and the third session is on the global bamboo construction businesses entrepreneurs from europe china and Latin America participated in this webinar as like some panelists. And our fourth session is on the mechanism for the capacity building, uh, uh, capacity building. And this session highlighted on the ways in which the training and capacity building can be uh, cost effectively provided uh, to the member states. So, uh, and then the today's session is on the standards, and uh, which is quite important. Uh, and uh, to cover the questions, um, there are few countries like in uh, in uh, Latin America which has adopted the bamboo standard uh, previously, and uh, specific credit lines have been like created for the bamboo construction. Probably, if anyone is interested, please follow or please like some send us the message to the trainings at unbar.int and uh, we can specifically provide you the answers. So, if we don't want to capture it, so we have not like some focused on it. Um, then it is important to thank the organizer of this like some webinar, uh, which is uh, the Bar Construction Task Force, uh, which uh, Ivy Trojello and uh, Kent and other like some members are already there. International Union of Architects, whom Bar collaborated in organizing the side event in COP26. School of Civil Engineering of the Sinhua University, School of Architecture. Architecture, Design, and Life Research Institute, all from the Xinhua University. We thank all of them for their contribution in organizing this five lives and webinar. And like so most importantly, we have to thank the supporting organization, University of Pittsburgh, Coventry University, BASE, Arup, World Architecture, School of Architecture uh, of the Beijing Forestry University, Journal of Landscape Architecture, Institute 
Topology Bandung, Journal of Building Structure, University of the West of England, MPBR Base, IL Anish Academy, uh, or the supporting organization who supported us in organizing this series of five legendary webinars. And most importantly, I want to acknowledge the contribution of Awu Kuai, who is the coordination, uh, who is the coordinator of this Unbar Construction Task Force and the construction coordinator for ISO TC 165 for the bamboo structure aspects. And also Xinghuai Liu, uh, who is also supporting us in organizing this lesson webinar. And importantly, Jinwai, who is the overall contributor of or the coordinator of the Unbar webinar like some series which we have been uh, conducting over the past year. So once again, in addition to David, I want to thank all the panelists of the today's session. I will after Manuel, uh, who is my co-moderator, as well as the moderators and panelists uh, of all the five uh, technical sessions we had in the past mm -hmm. one month. So mm -hmm. many thanks indeed for all of you and for all the contribution you have done to uh, accomplish this interesting task. So with his words, I want to formally close this uh, webinar today, as well as the webinar series on the construction. So many thanks and have a good day, good afternoon, good evening, and good night for the colleagues from the front time zone. So many thanks indeed. Bye bye. Yeah, but before we go, can we take photos? Can we take group photos? Group photos. <laughs> Uh, could everybody turn on their uh, camera? Let me see your face and smile. Yeah, Solomon, I saw you're in outside in the wild. Okay, now, uh, uh, Chen, you can help me No. Oh, oh, page one. One, two, three. Three. Okay, now go. I, I go page two. Oh, we have so many people. Page two. Are you ready? One, two, three. Okay, Christine. Now go page three. We have five page pages, so be patient. Page four, now I go to page five. Okay, finally, so many people. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jinwai. Okay, then bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, Thank you, Marty. Thank you, Dr. Mutu. Thank you. Thank, thank you. All. Thank you, thank you Tony. Thank you, Darcy. Oh, thank you, Xavier. Elsa. Bye. Thank Bye. you, Bye. Solomon. Bye -bye. <laughs> Bye Bye. Have a wonderful day. Bye bye. Good night. Good night and 